2024 began with fresh Israeli atrocities on the people of Gaza as the offensive continued unabated. What is the latest from this battlefield? A study by Public Services International throws light on the mental health issues faced by healthcare professionals. What does this report say? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, please hit that subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube. The death toll in Gaza has crossed 22,000 as the genocidal Israeli offensive continues unabated. In the 24 hours up to Tuesday afternoon, over 200 people were killed. This is in addition to Israeli atrocities in the West Bank. Meanwhile, the offensive also continues to have regional implications with tensions on the rise in Syria, Yemen and other parts of West Asia. We go to Abdul for the details. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. The year beginning with, of course, Israeli attacks continuing, uh, scores of, in fact, I think the number is over 200 people killed in just one day alone. Could you give us an update of what is happening on the ground with respect to the offensive? Well, uh, as per the latest reports, the overall uh, number of Palestinians killed in the uh, in the Israeli attack since uh, October 7 has crossed almost 22,000 uh, people. Uh, the number of Palestinians injured, of course, is touching 58,000. Uh, and you rightly pointed out that in the last 24 hours, at least 200 more Palestinians have been killed in the Israeli attacks. Uh, as per the latest reports, uh, Israeli ground offensive is ongoing in Khan Yunis. They have asked the residents of Khan Yunis to evacuate and basically relocate into a small uh, territory, which is considered to be even smaller than an average airport, where around two million, uh, uh, sorry, around uh, uh, one point, uh, around 18, 1.8 million people uh, are basically forced to uh, uh, live uh, as per the uh, latest uh, data. Then there are reports that the Israeli ground forces, a part of them have withdrawn from the northern uh, uh, Gaza, which basically has uh, prompted a large number of Palestinians who have been displaced to move back to their uh, territories. We do not know whether this movement is temporary because Israeli uh, withdrawal might be a, a tactical move it may the forces may come come back, but for the while people because people are so desperate to move back to their whatever uh, their houses are left to uh, to those places and uh, try to kind of uh, begin living in quote unquote whatever normal is there. Apart from that, there are also reports from reports uh, uh, in different parts of Gaza that how uh, the, uh, the the repeated bombing uh, in different, uh, uh, particularly the refugee areas, uh, has basically led to further displacement of the people. So overall, offensive inside the Gaza Israeli offensive continues despite the tactical withdrawal from here and there, and uh, despite the uh, talks about uh, exchange of. Uh, Prisoners. As per the latest report, uh, Israel has rejected an offer uh, put forward by the uh, Palestinian resistance groups uh, of ceasefire in in, to, uh, in, in return of uh, the uh, release of all the hostages, and uh, it seems that Israel will continue to uh, attack uh, Gaza for uh, because as per the uh, statement given by Israeli officials. Uh, on uh, Monday, that they were claiming that the uh, protest, uh, sorry, the attack will continue for months to come. So uh, this is the overall situation. Uh, if you see, the, uh, this has also led to a uh, worsening humanitarian situation as well. Uh, there were uh, uh, videos coming from the region, which basically shows how uh, a large number of Palestinians are in a very desperate situation. And, and therefore, they are running behind the aid trucks, whatever limited uh, aid is reaching uh, the reason. There is a desperation all over Gaza. Yeah. Well, Abdul, also, uh, could you maybe take us through what's happening at the regional and international basis in terms of the responses, in terms of the mass mobilizations as well? Well, uh, uh, if we just expand, uh, go out of Gaza and see that there, there is a continued Israeli attack inside West Bank. Uh, on Monday, there were five Palestinians killed. Then there were raids going on in different parts of uh, occupied West Bank. 
um then of course uh, israeli forces have repeatedly targeted southern lebanon and more and more there are reports coming that there, there are uh, scores of pe- uh, people in lebanon have also been killed in those attacks then there uh, on monday there was a report from sana the syrian uh, arabic uh, news agency which basically said that there were uh, bombings inside uh, damascus the capital this was another uh, uh, of course there are thousands of attacks which have israel has carried out since 2011 but this is particularly in the context of the ongoing war in gaza uh, of course the 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 most significant development as terms of regional uh, uh, aspect is concerned that there are reports coming uh, that uh, on tuesday afternoon Uh, there was an attack on uh, another uh, us base in iraq um, the, num- the there are not yet uh, the number of casualties and other things is not yet there uh, are not yet there but of course uh, it it basically signifies that the the attack on the us bases all across the region has not stopped in fact they have increased uh, uh, and particularly because uh, us is seen as the main a uh, facilitator of the genocide in gaza apart from that there on uh, sunday there was an attack on the uh, houthi boats uh, three of them were sank uh, basically by the uh, sorry by the us uh, navy uh, in which 10 uh, houthi uh, soldiers were killed and that led to a kind of suspension a temporary suspension of the whatever whatever operation the shipping company had started uh, following the us assurances there was a suspension of, of operation for a while and it seems that the houthis have uh, re- uh, basically again reiterated uh, uh, that they will continue to attack the ships which are heading to israel no matter how much uh, uh, us is basically trying to uh, pressure, uh, pressurize and trying to attack uh, their just cause for palestinian uh, uh, liberation uh there is there is another major development which need to be noted whether uh, we are not sure what would be the implication but there was a report that the israeli uh, sorry iranian destroyer has reached the red sea on monday uh and this may be a routine operation but this uh, given the context of uh, attacks on houthi vessels and the attack on israeli uh, sorry I- iranian officials inside syria uh in fact musavi was killed uh, uh on christmas day so uh, given the context and given the larger uh, 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 momentum which is in and around the uh, war israeli war in gaza this can have uh, other meanings as well but this is too early to say anything uh, uh, sure uh, c- concrete about it at this moment hey, thank you so much abdul for the update Healthcare professionals have been facing exceptional levels of stress over the past few years especially due to the covid pandemic a new study by public services international tries to analyze the crisis of mental health in this sector and the structural reasons for it it is important to note that the crisis did not begin with the pandemic decades of underfunding and neoliberal policies played a huge role the study analyzes conditions in a number of countries including canada brazil liberia etc for more details we have anna prachar and thank you so much for joining us a very important issue that's often not much attention is paid to it often the uh, mental health of healthcare professionals it's been a very very difficult set of years for many of these professionals not just with covid but even in the aftermath and now we even have a fresh uh, variant of covid as well so could you maybe take us through what the studies in general what is its what are its overall conclusions Well, it starts from the premise that COVID-19, of course, made the situation much worse. So we know that, you know, um, even before the pandemic started, health workers were struggling with uh, with uh, both uh, physical and mental health problems because of the work conditions that they uh, they they have to endure every day. And so the premise of the of the uh, of this uh, of this uh, research done by uh, by Public Services International uh, is that the pandemic, because of all the accumulated load that we have from from years before, uh, essentially made things implode, and that it should be taken into consideration. It had that it had to be addressed urgently if we don't want to lose the health workers that we have, uh, and also. you know to to be able to essentially rebuild the health workforce that we need 
of course uh, the the global issue that we have in uh, in in the uh, in the health workforce numbers uh, is well it's global so it affects everyone uh, the the study does show that so uh, it looks at sweden it looks at australia at canada but it also looks at brazil uh, and liberia which uh, which kind of tries to to show the differences that we do have between the high income countries and the low and middle income countries. So, uh, but what they all share, of course, is uh, that the um, the conditions that health workers are facing today uh, are essentially caused by the by the years of neoliberal policies that we have seen implemented by the pressures of the IMF of other uh, of, uh, of other financial institutions, uh, and it essentially shows that the landscape uh, that has been formed. Uh, depends on much more than just uh, you know the 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 national the local context uh, and uh, has to be dealt with also at different levels so you know uh, for example it also brings uh, it brings good, good examples of how trade unions uh, have been uh, have been um, essentially successful in addressing some of the smaller issues that they have seen. And this is particularly true uh, in uh, in the high income countries that I've mentioned before. Uh, of course, the trade union actions are not enough to address the whole problem because they're not uh, uh, they're not able, for example, to point out and to counter the fact that high income countries are trying to resolve the, their uh, health workforce shortages by recruiting from abroad by recruiting from countries who have an even less health workers. But it does show that a strong trade union presence makes a difference when we talk about uh, health workers and their health. Right, Anna, it's interesting thing about the study is, like you said, how it co covers various kinds of countries. And I think we'd like to talk about two examples today. Let's first take Brazil, which is one of the countries that has been studied. What are the conclusions from Brazil? Well, mm, Essentially, Brazil, uh, what uh, what Brazil has gone through, the health system in Brazil, especially since Temer and Bolsonaro took uh, took office, uh, is that there was a deterioration of work conditions in the healthcare in the healthcare sector. So, what the study shows is something that uh, health activists in Brazil have also been warning about for uh, for for a very long time is that the loss of social security that uh, that we have seen, the reforms of labor policies that have reduced workers' rights. Um, the overlooking of the needs of health workers and particularly nurses who are one of the uh, one of the biggest groups in uh, in Brazil's uh, health system have led to a worse uh, worsening health among health workers and again nurses are one of the biggest groups that uh, that have been affected by this uh, many of them and then uh, including during the pandemic uh, they have been forced to work multiple jobs to make ends meet uh, they have not had access to adequate uh, adequate PPE, uh, PPE, so protective equipment. Um, essentially, what mm, they have seen is rising levels of anxiety, of depression, of uh, sleep issues, uh, even of burnout. So, uh, what's uh, what the situation is now is that there has been a very important step forward when the national uh, minimum wage for nurses was was voted into um, into practice. Uh, but for now, uh, it is still problematic to see how this uh, how this measure will be implemented fully because we know that there have been mobilizations in the private sector uh, of employers who do not want to see this implemented. Uh, and uh, by this, they are again making a gross disservice to to the nurses' mental and and physical health. And moving across to another continent where many of these issues prevail, Liberia is a country that has been studied. So could you maybe tell us a bit about that also? Well, you know, in, in Liberia, again, we are talking of, about a very specific context because the health uh, health system has been weakened by, by different by different things. And even if we look uh, only at, uh, at the year starting from uh, 2013 we know that ebola has had a gross impact on uh, on how health has uh, has looked uh, in liberia now what's interesting to see is that you know um, ebola essentially has been uh, a practical example and a lesson for Liberia to uh, organize the COVID-19 response. But on the other hand, Liberia has so few health workers uh, that it, this has meant that the, those few who have been working in the local health system had to be redistributed to COVID-19 services. This, of course, takes a toll. And then, of course, it doesn't help then that uh, many of the people who are working in Liberia 
are forced to emigrate because the because the work conditions are so bad. And then again, uh, what's very interesting for me in, in this part of the study is that it shows that it's not about, it's not just about Liberia's government, it's not, not about Liberia's government making the wrong decisions, it's not about, um, you know, something that's very local. Uh, it's It has very much to do with how the IMF uh, is approaching Liberia and how it's forcing it uh, to orient its health system to uh, on a volunteer basis, discrediting the health workers that are there and essentially not giving them, them a chance to uh, to build a strong health system which would benefit all. Arana, thank you so much for that update. That's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you.